This week on RSBNB Update, the first in the new Elder God storyline is here, and we give it the RSBNB Update quest treatment. Plus, two simple designs for the comp cape and bank rework that have players talking. Is it for better or worse? We have the answers. This is RSBNB Update, episode 724, recorded Thursday, May 16th, 2019. Desperate Times and Simple Designs. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of RSBNB Update. It is Quest Week once again here at the podcast, and you know how much we just love these weeks here. Uh, there, there's something that doesn't come around as much as they need to in this day and age, so every Quest Week we get, we... we take them in we treasure them and um you know it, it just it's it's just a full wholesome experience that's what rsbnb update was built on so tanis you're back as per usual thank you shane hard to believe it's been two and a half years since endgame right i wow. try not to remember that wow man <laughs> a long time um but also joining us for this quest week is Diana, who was on last year, most famously for the needle skips, and then earlier again this year <laughs> most for the famously. <laughs> then earlier again this year for the cheesecake quest. Welcome back. Thank you. It's been such a good week for Law Hounds. We got a fantastic quest and a law stream, and I can't ever remember that happening at, like in the same week. So, lots of very happy Law Hounds running around at the moment. Yeah. So I think they they did they've done a good job with how they're uh, splitting that apart and not offering up too much lore in the actual uh, streams. So we'll talk about that as, at various points throughout the uh, mm-hmm. time here. But um, so this quest is called Desperate Times, and we're going to run through it, and we're going to discuss most of it and the ramifications uh, going forward on that. So obviously, spoilers ahead for this episode of RSBNB Update. Uh, we don't normally say that, but it is a quest week, so just be full warned that that is going to happen. But we also do have other big news this week, including... Two dev blogs, one on the comp cape rework, which I ne- I actually needed to sleep on before deciding how I felt about it. Um, but we'll get to that after, as well as something that uh, was just sprung on us today, and that is another dev blog saying that the bank that the bank update is happening and placeholders will be joining it. So we'll oh, discuss all of that and more on this jam packed episode of RSBNB update. Big week, big, big, week. big, and yeah. you know it, it, it's it's. It's good this all happened this week because um, I actually have an announcement about next week and the week after that we're uh, that I'll get to later in the show. But nonetheless, um, we'll just uh, leave that at that, and that'll be listeners' reward for listening to the end. So, as I said, spoilers ahead, and we're going to start off discussing desperate times right now. And you know, this quest follows from the events of Sliske's Endgame. Sliske's Endgame is, of course, a recommended quest to know exactly. Um, what was happening with it. And JX has said that, you know, we're not going to put in hard requirements that you're effectively going to need 10 years of quest to do our newest uh, intermediate or beginner quest. Well, this isn't a beginner quest, but intermediate quest. Um, do you guys think that someone who was coming in into the game and starting to play Desperate Times with 50 mining smithing and divination and who has just done the needle skips and you are it? will be able to grasp the full ramifications of what is going on in this quest? Hell no. Yeah, I'd say no. Just <laughs> no. Um, quite a lot of the stuff, I think we'll obviously talk about it later, but the really good part of the quest, to me, needed like quests going all the way back to the World Wakes Yeah, for it to have the weight that it did have. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, and you're you, you, you're like right in the beginning. You got this room full of all these people. You wouldn't know who half of those people were were gods or a big whatever you know, characters. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't snake. know what any of them were. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. Um, apparently, uh, this is how we're going to weave these in uh, from the Q and A. But um, there was uh, so apparently some dialogue between King Roald and Sir Mick that went missing, as well as uh, some oh, that was funny. Aquarius dialogue. Well, we can talk about that later uh, when we get to the live stream part because you know they they did actually act that out on live stream but uh, it wouldn't make much sense to play that right now yeah. um but anyways as i mentioned 50 mining smithing and divination as well as completion of the needle skips and you are it so that kind of infers about where we were headed with this quest um 
big, I think. And, you know, I, I think the first thing I want to talk about with this quest is that, you know, once you get up there and you start talking with Sarah and you're presented with this new uh, graphic cutscene, as, as they're calling it, because, you know, normally when we have quests, they have these... They have cutscenes and they're rendered in game. And they wanted to do some voice acting with this. But the issue with this, they said in the live stream, is that in doing in doing a full fully rendered cutscene using the in-game graphics engine, if they want to change a bit of dialogue or remove a couple words here or there, also there are issues of pacing. You basically need to re-record the entire clip. Whereas with these graphic cutscenes, timing isn't much of an issue, and they're a lot cheaper and a lot easier to make now. Um, I really enjoyed the graphic cutscene. How about you, both of you? I loved them. Like I've always not really been a fan of the old cutscene style, and I know I'm not supposed to say that as someone who's a fan of the lore, but I've always thought it just—they're quite—they just looked a bit clunky to me. So coming this sort of line of graphic novel style of the, the stylized art. I wasn't expecting it, but I thought it looked really good, especially with the voice acting. Um, yeah, so I thought there was a very good change, and I hope they keep going with it. Me too. Me too. Yeah. I love the fact that we had voices. That was mm-hmm. great. Um, I don't know. It seems like we can't have everything at the same time. So if I have to pick one, I'd much rather have my voices and, you know, being able to hear it. Um, but it reminded me a lot of, like, anime style, and I don't. No, it's this wasn't really anime thing. style. No, really? I mean, no, that's what I no, think. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't really? think so, no. Uh, it was more like yeah. um, like some kind of animatic. Yeah. Like, not strictly yeah. animation. Almost a comic like the, book, the pre- almost. Maybe. Yeah, like the, the okay. precursor to animation. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I'd put it. So. It was nice and distinctive and kind of, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, and, and there was more. There was one at the beginning and one at the end, and mm-hmm. um, they, they definitely added to it, and... Uh, This is something I would want to see continue on into the future. So after the graphic cutscene, you're in in, in, uh, Saren's council at the top of uh, Berthorpe Castle. And there you have to talk to everybody to try and figure out what exactly is going on. And, you know, the idea that that came around with this is that, oh, maybe maybe we should try and start to appease the Elder Gods in some way that we need to convince them that we can actually work together and we're not worthy of – destruction and the idea that comes up is first one is to appease Bic, the elder god of nature and plants and everything uh to that effect by building a big farm so the the goal here is to of course find an area where you can build the farm you also need to find a um workforce to tend the farm and then you also need to find a stock of seeds and you talk to all the various faction leaders there and you, you try to come up with various combinations that will work but after four attempts, you discover there's no combination here that's going to work, and that was intentional in in the quest design. So, um, I I actually had my hopes up at the beginning for this one because it sounded like oh we might be we might be getting <laughs> building some kind of farming guild. I yeah I thought it was going to be a nice peaceful chill. Oh let's do some gardening quest, but no, obviously no, that's not no. going to happen. <laughs> no, anytime the elder gods comes in, that that ain't going to happen. <laughs> So. It kind of derailed me a bit at the start because I went in expecting it to be all sort of intense and then it started off with this sort of quite gentle tone. And I just like, I don't really know what to expect anymore. And then Carapac turned up. So that threw that out the window. Yeah. Okay. So we know nothing's going to work and then Carapac appears and, you know, <laughs> this, is the, this is the point of the quest where I think the ramification of what was happening set in. Because, you know, everybody comes to the conclusion that, hey, we're not going to find something that's going to work. We're not going to be able to carry this forward. So Karapak comes in and he says that uh, there's an art- elder artifact known as the Needle. It will allow us to effectively wind back time a bit to put the Elder Gods back to sleep. Did you guys believe him when he said that? Oh. Um. Yeah, because I just finished the needle last night, which was awesome. By the way, good quest, good good quest, isn't it? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, like that was cool. Very so I'm good like, quest, yeah, yeah, I mean, it makes makes sense, right? I I was very suspicious at this stage because yeah. I don't Me know. My, my my instinct from the start was just that he's up to something. 
like as a character he would never ask us for help with anything unless it's for his own gain yeah yeah so and he's a dragon he's again. Just, yeah you just don't trust them yeah. <laughs> like and I mean, they obvious like you know this is one case for me where having completed Sliske's Endgame and all of the quests leading up to it, you know exactly that there's got to be something else up here. Whereas if a novice was playing this quest coming in, they would think it's all you know s- sunshine and rainbows because mm-hmm. we have to remember, of course, that the dragonkin were held under the curse of the elder gods by the Stone of Jazz. So yeah, and in they, and it's quite interesting seeing what they're like now. They haven't got that, yeah, and they haven't got that rage in them anymore. Mm-hmm. And See, of course, it was Carapac at the end of Sliske's Endgame that destroyed the Stone of Jazz to get mm. back at the Elder Gods. So, with this in mind, you know you have something saying that this might not add up to what we hope it will be. Yeah. See, I, I took it as like I, I just thought they would be scared of them. Like, if anyone would know the wrath of the Elder Gods, it was the Dragonkin. It's kind of like... So I didn't really notice anything strange okay. at that point. All right. Um, after that, uh, you need to head, of course, to the Needle, which is where the Needle Skips took place. And, you know, for anybody who hasn't done that quest, do that quest. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely <laughs> engaging from a story perspective, RuneScape's most uh, engaging experience. I think we said on that one that that was the first quest that ever gave us chills. It's, it, it, I still think it's the best one they've ever done. Yeah. Like it, it really is something special. Yeah. Like, go yeah. play it. Everyone go play it. It's great. Okay. So you head back to the needle and you talk with Carapac there and uh, he effectively says that uh, his his magic uh, can work to basically tune in with the needle to do that. But in doing that, a bunch of temporal instabilities open up and you need to go close those. And, you know, I, I, I always have to have a chuckle at this because for a long time it was said that there would be no time travel in RuneScape and obviously we are flirting with that very thing here with the needle and you know i don't think we we didn't travel back did we because everything we saw was a vision right that's about to say that this quest i was a bit nervous to start with when they brought in the needle yeah are we just going to go back in time and do something and but it wasn't strictly time travel it was viewing things have have already happened through the needle's perspective yes and more like memories rather than having any kind of influence on what happens Mm-hmm. Um, which I think was more of an inter- interesting way of doing it and got out of the whole time travel is just cheating. Yeah, and thing. you know, I, I think we don't, we definitely don't want to see time travel become a, a major plot device in RuneScape. It's best to save that for, you know, the odd episode of Star Trek or something to that effect. <laughs> so, um, so th- following through this, uh, you know, we close the temporal instabilities and then it's found that um, that Carapac doesn't have the necessary power to do what he wants to do to weave the Elder Gods to sleep with uh, just the needle. So he says, oh, we, 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 might need, we might need an additional bit of power or something that can act as a, act as a bit of a, uh, I guess, what would you call it? An enchantment, I guess? Would that be a good way of putting it on onto the needle? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a bit of extra stuff. Yeah. Um, and, of course, who is the best enchanter that has ever been known to RuneScape? Charos. Charos. Which yeah. is where You Are It comes in. Yeah. I wasn't expecting You Are It to come in because um, I've always thought of that as a bottle quest. Yeah, same. Same. And and it was, you know, when it came out, it was effectively um, giving lore or adding a bit of lore to the Clue Scrolls. Mm. Which and is, introducing Karos more as a independent character. And now you see why that was needed. Mm. So it's actually been decided. And if you did the little mini quest at the end of You Are It, you found that Charos is actually still alive, except he was disguised as someone else in RuneScape. Yes. And, you know, this is why you do the mini quests at the end of any quests that are around. And um, this was actually one of the requirements 
in you are it is that you needed the Charles necklace where you went around the world to get all the various different fragments that you did after you are it and um i enjoyed that little mini quest after you are it and i think we discussed it then so we won't discuss it um too much now but this necklace actually forms the main plank of finding and meeting charles and in order to figure out where exactly he is um charles has some tasks for you he has of course puzzles Mm -hmm. and little riddles yeah little riddles um i i got most of them the only one i didn't really get was the third one i usually i'm terrible at riddles and i actually managed to get all of them i had to think about the second one a fair bit yeah the second one was a took a bit but the third one um i actually had to look up and that one turned out to be the black knight fortress the second mm-hmm. one was um the top floor Barrow. of Varrock castle and the first one was i think fairly obvious um the empty throne room where the outside the empty throne room rather at the dig site where the dark anamica is so mm. Um, and this is where Raven's um, <laughs> Raven talked about this on stream. The um, the dialogue bugs came in because when I did it and I went into Varrock Palace, um, Ceramic Vars and the King were just kind of staring at each other awkwardly across the table, and I went, ran past thinking, "Oh, that looks a bit weird," and then didn't really think anything of it. Oh, there. It turns oh, out they oh, were supposed to be having. Okay. Yeah, they were supposed to be having a full conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and it just didn't turn up. Um, but they acted that out on the law stream for yeah. us, which was very kind of them yeah. and absolutely hilarious. So go and watch it. If, you, if you've missed that, it was great. I've actually linked that in the show notes as well um, yeah. for anybody who wants to um, pull that up. And at, at the various three points, there is a little portal that you can go into. And this takes you back to a room that looks like uh, Charles's tomb with various different uh, rooms and other things on the floor. Now... I I don't know if I, if what I'm going to say here is is something that uh, should be said, but I didn't find the puzzles that difficult once I figured it out. Um, I'd agree. It was the figuring them out that took me a little while. Yeah. So what but happens once they were figured out? They were quite like not nice little satisfying, not hugely difficult. Yeah. So what happens here is there's little markers on the floor and you step on one of these markers and it will open up a different room. And when you open up that room, there will be a number of uh, things on the floor. So, for example, one might have an old recipe. And if there's an old recipe, you get something that says, um, for example, one cup of wine, 800 grams of sweet corn, 100 grams of bacon, and 800 grams of Crandorian hops. And the idea behind this was that if... This can be represented as a Roman numeral. When it's a recipe, you put the Roman numeral in, a single Roman numeral, whereas if it can't, you would just put the first letter of the ingredient in. That was that was the recipe one. Mm-hmm. Um, I, had a, I had a recipe one that didn't work. Um, That's confusing. I, I, don't, I, I don't understand. So if it's the first letter... Of. If if um so Roman numerals are I for one, V for five, X for ten, L for fifty, C for a hundred, D for five hundred, and M for a thousand. I don't know that those off the top of my head, I am reading those off the wiki. Um if the if all the numbers in the recipe are one of those, you use Roman numerals. If they're not, then you go for the first letter of whatever it is. Right. So the very fact that this had 800, 800 grams of sweet corn and 800 grams of Crandorian hops, that would be WSBK. Yeah, so it's the um, letter of the word rather than the Roman numeral of the number. So that's how I didn't get one of those ones in my round of it. They were all procedurally generated puzzles. So each, everybody gets a different. Yeah, that was interesting too. That was interesting too. Um, Mm, I like that. I liked it. There was also another one where there were coins on the floor. So you would examine each stack of coins and each of those would correspond to a Roman numeral. And then you would put that into the, into the padlock and that would be the code. Mm -hmm. So if you had, if you had um, 500, what did we say 500 was? 500 is D. Okay. So if you had 500, 100, 50, and 1, uh, that would be uh, D, C, L. L, I. I, yeah. There we are. So 
Um, then the, the other puzzle was that if there was just one item on the floor, it was going to be a four-lettered item, and you would just spell out that item. Mine was clay. C-L-A-Y. Cake. Okay, yeah. yours was cake. Um, and then there was there was another one where there's four items on the floor, and that would be the first letter of each item. And I think that was the extent of the puzzles that I uh, had to do on this. Then there was just I a, had. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I had one of the lodestone ones as well, where they had a series oh, of four of shields for the lodestones, and you had to put in the first letter of each um, of the towns. Oh, and Orion neat. put up quite a funny tweet. Um, because he forgot to do some profanity checking. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a Canifis, Oodlog, Canifis. Um, Karamja. Oh, what's the... Yeah, Karamja. And that was one of the ones, and he forgot to um, profanity check that. <laughs> so, <laughs> oops. Well, I mean, hey, it's procedurally generated, right? You can't yeah. blame people for having a dirty mind on that. <laughs> I kind of want to know how much work goes into generating something like that, like a procedurally generated puzzle set. Well, like I'm going to assume that generating them is easy, but making sure they work is hard. Hmm. So I have no idea how you'd even go about yeah. starting one of those. Like it looks quite fun to put together. Uh huh. Um, and then after you do each of these little puzzles, there's a little slide puzzle on the floor that's kind of akin to what you would do in a puzzle box. And uh, it's actually important to note that when you're doing these puzzles, you want to note down somewhere what exactly all the words were on um, on maybe a separate piece of paper. Because what that does is it gives you a three by three grid showing of what you want the thing in the middle of the room to look like. So if you don't note that down, you're going to need to redo the puzzle to to find that so you'll definitely mm -hmm. want to note that down uh tannis hopefully that helps with the puzzles because <laughs> they're being all procedurally <laughs> generated there's not going to be a guide yeah. for it <laughs> no i well I, I mean i just didn't even understand how it, it, puzzles aren't my thing man yeah That's, i know it's not with these thing. ones once you once you get kind of the the basic principles of each one they're not difficult it's just trying to understand what it took me a while to try to get okay i'm in this room there's no hints what do i do here but once you've got that from the first round of puzzles you just it's the same thing three times like they don't get more difficult or anything like that right. Right on. all right so after you uh after you solve the third one you get this message that just appears on the screen you are it you are it you are it and of course that <laughs> tells us where to go because i uh, recall that in the you are it quest reldo in uh the in the Varrock library was a uh was, was the key figure of that and that's one of the places we kept going back to so mm. the very fact that uh that popped up i think answers why you are it or why um why we went back to the Varrock library so and at this point is when I was halfway done the quest and um, the big reveal, the first big reveal of this is that uh, Reldo is actually Charos and uh, the disguise is removed uh, temporarily, I think. Or is it temporarily? I didn't go back and see him after the quest. I assume he's back. Well, I don't Reldo. know what he's like now. I, I don't actually know. I haven't been back to the library yet. But I know he remains as Charos for the rest of the quest. Yeah, definitely for the rest of the quest. Hmm. Okay. So... In doing this, we we go talk to we talk, go talk to Charles in the Varrock Library, and he he knew what we were gonna do. And I, I mean, I, I guess that makes sense, right? I mean, he is one of the most convincing people in all of RuneScape, so it, it makes sense that uh, that he would know what we were gonna do. And um, they said in the stream they're modeling after Himmick after kind of like a Loki type character, so that kind of know-it-all trickster okay. type person. Yeah, that, so, that makes sense. I could see that. Yeah, it fits, doesn't it? He, yeah. he would know. Or even if he doesn't know, he'd say he would know and say it convincingly enough that we'd believe him. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you think he knew what Carapac was going to do next? Um, oh, what do you mean by that? In, you terms, by of, in terms of what Carapac's actual intentions were? With the spell? From what Kara said at that point, I don't think he did. He acted very surprised when it happened. Okay. Like right at the end. Yeah, that would make sense because he's not necessarily in league with the dragonkin at all. 
Yeah, um, he seems like a bit of a neutral character. Yeah. So in order to make, uh, make the device that will allow Karapak's spell on the needle to work, you need three rune bars, two rune stone spirits, uh, ten gleaming energy, and ten mine runes. You bring those back to Charles, and he makes the, that device uh, no problem. Um, nice to see a note for or use for stone spirits, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you had in mind, Shane? Yeah, did you, you too. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking obscure quest content, 100%. <laughs> so. Um, so with that, uh, we head back to uh, head back to the needle, and let's just say that oh, hell breaks loose <laughs> at this point. This this is this is the fun part. This yeah, is where um, it got really really good from here on in. Yeah, to to use a bit of to use a bit of uh, colorful language here, you could say the this is about where the where the shit hits the fan. I guess you could say mm-hmm. on this. Because, you know, we think we're going to ultimately use the needle and have it put the Elder Gods back to sleep with this device now. Um, Gale appears and is absolutely having none of this. And Karapak says that uh, he needs to battle Gale in order to um, turn, be able to fight back against the Elder Gods and turn back time and put them to sleep. And during the battle, Karapak just sends us into a temporal distortion. And we have we have nothing to say about it, and you know there we go. We're just in the, we just get sent into this temporal distortion. Karapak is off on the world, doing his uh, doing his his thing. And you know when you first enter this temporal distortion, you are confronted by images of Sliske that are level fifty, and you need to kill them. Um, oh, this this part here with Sliske and Gothics was. It was a shock. It was such a shock. I mean, I don't know whether it's just me because that whole quest, like The World Wakes, is a very special quest uh-huh. to me. Like, it's the one that made me sit up and pay attention to the law. And yeah. kind of, I, I, it, I'm, I'm very, very fond of it. And then to get back to that cave and just have to do it all again. And especially when you get to the part with. Like, well, whenever you fight the, the Sliske clone, you get a piece of broken mask and you do that five times and you get a bit of extra voice acting between Sliske and Guthix each time. We've never had voice acting for Guthix before and it was really lovely to hear. Yeah, I agree. And then you put it all together and you make the mask, you make Sliske's mask and the option becomes where? That, oh, that was creepy. That was yeah. so, <laughs> so yeah. creepy. I, I don't know if, I, I mean, I know we had to put that on for the quest, but oh, oh boy. That was yeah. that was asking a lot of the player because so it it puts you it puts you in this mindset <clears throat> that after you put the mask on you feel as though you are eff- effectively seeing things through Sliske and this was actually addressed in the live stream were you using the needle to go back and were you actually Sliske killing Gothics at this point in time and thankfully thankfully I think that's a question everybody had. The answer was no. You were just viewing this through Sliske's lens when we this was happening. We weren't doing it ourselves because yeah. I don't think. I think what what we haven't seen that the thing we're both talking about is that you have to kill Guthics. Yeah. And you you put the mask on and you kind of become Sliske. You, know, you transmog to Sliske, and you have a bit of dialogue between the the World Guardian, the player character, and Sliske, which is the first time we've had the ending of Endgame. Spoiler alert. There's a hint that Sliske is not actually dead. There's a piece of him in the world guardian somehow yeah. it yeah. was hinted at at the end never resolved this is the first time we've had it properly developed a bit and you go up to the the great shadow of Guthix at the end of his shrine and the option is kill <laughs> and i that, this was raven's fault this is entirely raven's fault yeah yeah and and i was just sitting there like do not make me do this please do not oh, make I, me do I, this I, I but obviously the, you I have the to no keep... option on that and you know you you do need to get to it and kill so that is how the quest pro- progresses. Yeah, but and if you press examine on that part, the examine text is kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. <laughs> I did not do that. Okay. Yeah, it's and if you try to leave, you can't leave. Like there is no way of getting out of it. But I tried. I tried to get out of it because I just did not want to do that. I didn't want to press the button. <laughs> it was oh, it was such a moment, and you know, it came out of nowhere. Like, 
but it was good. It was like this this entire sequence, and then the bit on um, Guthrie's homeworld afterwards. I think was the highlight of the quest for me. Yeah, you, you know, you, you got to. In you know, speaking of that, after you kill him, you do end up on Guthrie's homeworld, and there you do interact with memories of all the. Uh, major gods and they all are effectively talking about their regrets um who would you say was the most powerful there i loved zamorax okay and i'm not just saying that as a fan of zamorak like because <laughs> these these whole memories were about um the moment Guthix cast them out yeah after the raising of foreign three yeah. and the the moment they were banished and I think the one we heard the most about in the past leading up to that was probably Saren, because that had been developed in the elf storyline. Mm -hmm. And we knew a bit about that from the lore of the Guthix Memorial as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's where, that's where it sounded familiar. I was trying to place that where I heard some of the stuff before. Okay. Yeah, his relationship with Saren was developed on a little bit there. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Um, but I, I really like the one about Zamorak because obviously he was the like, it's, it's Zamorak's fault that it happened that the, they were all cast out in the first place yeah um, he used the Stone of Jazz to destroy Foreign 3 yeah um, I think we knew it, that before right yeah we did we yeah. did I'm just recapping okay. that but he was it was the first time you kind of there was almost some sympathy for him so that come across him and he was you know defeated and there's nothing worse than defeat like you did, I didn't really expect that from Guthix to have that kind of empathy yeah, um, and, and you know, I, I think um, looking at this, it it kind of provides a perspective on what could have been if um, events at the World Wake didn't actually happen in terms of Gothics winding up dead. And, you know, I, I think that's going to be a, a point we're going to be asking ourselves for a long time because that's effectively led us into two different uh, storylines now if that's something that um, that we wanted. So... Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, this is, a would say, probably the biggest part of the quest that you want to pay attention to. Um, Armadil's was interesting, too, um, talking about uh, the separation between him and his uh, loved ones as well. He'd and, been described as dangerous yeah, because that, he's so that naive. Yeah, that's a bit odd. That's a bit odd. But, I mean, yeah. I, gu I guess you could see s describing someone who is naive as dangerous when it comes to certain situations. Mm. So. Hmm. Um, you ready to move on to the next part, the big one, the big one? Yeah, go for it. So after this, we head to the Empyrean Citadel. But before you do that, you got to adjust um, some mut mutable anima projectors to um, direct them into Karapak. And after you do that, you end up at the Empyrean Citadel. And this is... Oh, sorry. Just before we head off to the Empyrean oh, sure. Citadel, you talk to Guthix as well. Oh, yes, that's right. For the first time since The World Wakes, you have a little chat with Guthix under the shadow of his own corpse, which is quite <laughs> morbid. Yeah. yeah. Um, another nice little raven touch there. <laughs> and, of course, this is all happening with the this the the, um, the skybox. They use the Eclipse skybox for it. So red and white and dramatic, deathly lighting. And then this huge corpse of Guthix leaning over it all. And, oh, it looked really good. Um and Raven said it was his favorite uh, part of the quest to do. And you can kind of see why. It's very his style. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say is your favorite part of the conversation with Guthix? Oh, whenever he says, forget me. And I'm just like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's his line. Move on. Forget me. And all the law hounds say, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> and... We're effectively, in this case, just to clarify, we're dealing with the memory of Gothics in this case. We're not actually mm. interacting with some kind of spirit of him, I'm guessing, right? I think so. It's not really clear. Yeah. But I think it's more like a memory or an observation. Rather, It's not him. It's kind of probably a manifestation using the powers that uh, were brought into that area with, I guess, any residual energy that might be left to Gothics, if you want to put it in a uh, thematic sense to Something make like sense that, of it. Yeah. So, And, you know, Guthix is there again telling the World Guardian that you're the only one that can make a difference. He tried, he failed. It is your job to um, effectively bring every everyone together and just do a better job than he did. So mm. I guess that's what uh, 
what the core aspect of this uh, of this quest series is going to be about. And uh, you know, I, I think when you um, when you put it all together, I'm gonna make I'm gonna go out on the limb here, and I'm gonna make a big theory on this that this entire Elder God arc, and if Jagex wanted to, you know, continue what they've been doing with just how um, emotionally impacting the needle skips was if they wanted to do something similar with this entire arc. Um, what if this is the big arc about forgiveness? Of who? Well, just forgiveness in general as a theme. Just in general. Yeah. See, I think it's going to, I, that would be a really interesting theme to explore. I mean, I've not been able to put my finger on what it is exactly they're trying to, what kind of story they're going to try and tell yet, because they're, they're only just starting. Um, it could go in so many different directions, depending on what tone they want to go. Yeah. And this was also touched on in the lore stream that they do want to get back to having quests not be so serious and, you know, effectively convey the tone of RuneScape that was developed over the decade and a half prior to when they went on to those big fantasy epics. So they said they're happy keeping the fantasy epics, but they want to keep the way they tell the fantasy epic a bit more lighthearted. Yeah. Which I think is something they did very, very well (laughs) in this one. Um, I think a couple of examples. You get to flirt with Karos, which <laughs> I, I want to know how many people chose that option because I know I did. <laughs> I, I chose the polite one. Oh, damn it. You missed out. Okay. And how, then, how did that go? I, well, he's just a flirty bastard. Okay. He's great. Right. And then um, whenever he's making the, uh, the artifact go on the needle, there's a little mini cutscene where you pick out a book from one of the bookshelves and it's the the lusty... Uh, Asgarnian maid which is to dig at Skyrim obviously <laughs> the, the lusty Argonian maid and um, I won't ruin it if you haven't played it yet but you can either choose to read it or put it back and if you read it it's got a very funny little kind of punny almost more like a bit of meta humour in I, there very, I, I, very I chose, RuneScape I chose style. to put that ba- book back I, have no interest. It, I don't know whether it's up on the wiki yet the transcript of what happens okay. if you read it but it's it's worth reading it's very funny <laughs> But it's very RuneScape style, like that sort of sl- silly meta humor. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think the is game in needs, there. needs more of that, and they can weave it in that way. Mm. Okay, so you then um, adjust the anima projectors so that they head on over to Carapac, and you wind up at the Imperian Citadel. And you know, when, when you're there, you have a conversation, or you get to at least see. Um, a conversation with Sliske talking about um, the staff, which you call the siphon. It's a great symbol to the gods. It will rally them. It will make them listen. What are the gods? It's a complicated question. They are mortals suffused with fragments of your great power that lets them tower over their own kin. They are, lo- they are focal points for the people of this world, leaders and figure of worship. That is precisely why we should bring them all together for you to study. And um, this this run through of the Empyrean Citadel, you don't really do anything here. This is just a way of learning a bit more about what's happening behind the scenes. And this is where you, I think we can say, learn the core of this quest that Carepack is up to no good. Um, mm. was- I think it's imp- – is it ever imp- – said who Cisco is talking to in that first bit of dialogue you just read out. No, I don't think so. I think it's implied that it's Jazz. That would make sense, I think. It's never really said who it is. Yeah. I, I, again, this is another sequence I love because they had voice acting all the way through it. Yeah. Um, so Cisco was voice acted, Carapac. There's the big... Uh, oh, it was just Cisco and Carapac, actually, wasn't it? Yeah. There's the big glob called Gilinor in one of the rooms as well from... Oh, um, oh the construct. Uh, the construct from... Which quest was that? Is it... Elegy. That's from Nomad's, Nomad's Elegy. Elegy. Okay. Oh, my God. That's another quest I'm really fond of because I like I knew something big was going to happen at the end. And I deliberately avoided all concept arts and stuff for what the okay. Gilinor construct was going to look like. I did the same with Endgame and Jazz, just so I had a surprise right. at the end. And I was horrified... Yeah, it's, it's, what it's it big actually lob, was. It's a big glob. Oh, and it had Guthix's face. Oh, God. yeah, you're right. It does, now that I see it. That's the, that, to me, that's the horrifying thing about it. Yeah. Like, now, yeah, to so see that again, I just did not want to see that again. I thought we were going to have to fight it for a second. Yeah, but you don't, yeah you just that's good we didn't. It. So, 
at this point, you run through the various rooms, and um, for anybody wondering, when you get to the Gielinar side, there's actually a um, agility obstacle course for anybody who forgot on the outside of the room. It took me a couple minutes to realize that that's what was happening with that. Um, then, you know, you get to Karapak, and you realize that, oh, he's, actu- he's actually up to this, and he uh, is using this to get revenge, and... Was was it at this point, or was it later on that we learned what his what his ultimate end goal for Gilinor is? I forget. Uh, properly not until the end of the okay. next puzzle. All right. So this is more leading up to it, and I and I want to ask you at this point: Did you um, were, were you kind of getting the direction it was going with Karapak and seeing what was said and how it was ominous? It was ominous, and I could tell he was up to something, but. I think that the the line for me was, all I need is enough anima. I can do it. I can set us free. I thought that was talking about the Stone of Jazz. Yeah. Which I think it was. It was. And then I think... um, Was there something else? No. I was definitely getting the feeling that this this bastard's up to something. What's he doing? (laughs) I don't really want to be helping him anymore. I I I, I thought we might have been heading towards, you know, the heart of Gilinar on something uh, to that effect. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then the final Sliske manifestation talks about uh, how he was hoping that uh, there would have been more god fighting and that the only one who killed <laughs> one of them was Armadil. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he, he wanted this to advance forward. And, and at this point, I, I have to ask, you know, with what we have left of Sliske and Karapak, is there any um, is there any potential that we're, is going to be some kind of alliance between Karapak and whatever's left of Sliske inside of us, oh, where we might, I hadn't, where we might I had, inten- unintentionally wind up trying to help Karapak because we got that bit of Sliske in us from. Uh, I Endgame. hadn't considered that, but that's a great idea. Because, you know, the character is obviously in the Empyrean Citadel, mm. and they have insight into us to this conversation between these two people and they're the only ones who have that insight and with that they're the only ones who know this and there's, there's got to be a reason for putting these two in the same room so i i wonder i wonder and i wonder how it's going to play out like in terms of how much of this is left and how much of, of him is part of the world guardian now and yeah. what implications that can have yeah. i hope they develop it further because i think they did it very well here kind of just little touches of it Mm -hmm. i'd love to see it develop further yeah and there's going to be lots of time for that too so Mm -hmm. um and you know after this there's one more uh final chat with carapac and this really um that pushed it forward for me and that you know uh talking about the anima and an invitation to the heart of gilinor so this kind of was like okay what's he up to and then um moving on beyond the the final part of this you wind up at various uh images that look like you are back at Sliske's endgame various points mm-hmm. in that fight uh, a couple more anima uh redirectors to redirect into Karapak, and then uh you're sent to the final one that puts you in something inside something that looks like elite dungeon 2 and you need to direct the final amount of anima all back to Karapak by collecting uh, memories uh, throughout this area. I don't know. There, I don't think there was anything in this memory. Uh, these were Fox memories, largely, I think, that we uh, gathered here. I don't know that there was much of consequence in those ones. Did you find anything of consequence in those? For the ones in... Um, Elite Dungeon the, 2 type area. There was the big one. Um, Visendathas, which is Karapak's son, confronting him about the big plot twist um, right at the end. This is how we found out, because... There, there's um, what there's three memories to collect. Yeah, one one of them's just a bit of backstory, and then the third one is you find out that Karapak's actually planning on doing something very dastardly, and he doesn't want us to find out. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the first one was, as you said, backstory, and then oh, oh boy. Now I guess the question is, how do we feel about the quest going this way? And this is where you really want to cover your ears if you're listening still and you don't want spoilers, because this is the ultimate one. 
it turns out that Carapac's whole plan for this is to sacrifice the world of Gielinar to appease the Elder Gods and prevent them from <laughs> destroying everything else. Yeah, Did, like just preventing yep. them from waking up in the first place by destroying Gielinar. And that that's his plan all along. And inadvertently, the World Guardians help him out. I don't know how I feel about the whole bait and switch thing. I liked it. Okay. I liked it. Like, I, I find the Dragonkin are really growing on me. Like, I didn't like them to start with, and I, I still don't really like them, but they're very interesting because they're left over from the previous revision. Right. So they are the oldest things around at the moment, other than the Elder Gods. So they're older than Saren and Zaros, I think, because they were created in, in this revision. Yeah. Um. And... Yeah, I can kind of see where they're coming from. Like, it's discussed in the post-quest dialogue a bit with Azanadra, saying it, you sacrifice one world to save the oh, rest of the universe. Oh, shoot, I didn't look at the post-quest dialogue. There's a, there's a little bit of discussion okay. about it there. All right, I'm going to go back and like, do that saying, after the show. Yeah, saying you, you kill off one world, but you save the rest of the universe. On balance. Like, it, it's that choice versus base survival. Yeah. So... The ends justify the means. Mm, or do they? <laughs> One small sacrifice. Or maybe that's yeah. going to be the bigger theme of this whole thing. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice and do the ends justify the means? Mm. And is there another way? Yeah. And is um, there another way that you can come up with with uh, Saren and all the other god um, emissaries, let's just say? You think Zaros mm. will appear at some point in the future for this? Because I know... His goal is probably... Well, he's in us too, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he's getting I, kind I of crowded. <laughs> Not I, as I hope much. He, I hope he does. He's. I think he's plotting something. I think well, everyone's he, he up to something. He wants to become an elder god. We know that. Yeah, he got slapped down quite violently there. Yeah. <laughs> Auntie Jas said no. Um, but yeah, no, it was a very interesting ending to the quest. And... That one thing that I actually we'll talk about that later after we've um, gone through what happens at the end because it's a little bit of a battle like after you come back to the real world. Um, I don't know where you're going to go through that or yeah, let's do that. Um, so after after you redirect Carapac, um, you wind up back at the real world, and lo and behold, well, what ends up happening is that the needle is stolen by Carapac. And he takes off and flies off towards the northeast. And he takes control of it from Gale. Yeah. As well. So Gale becomes Primrose once more. Oh, is she going to die now? This is the thing I was going to bring up. Have we just killed Primrose? That's actually a good question. Like, it's not resolved, it's not said, but have we just killed Primrose? I think that was, the, that was, to. wasn't that the implication in the needle skips of what would happen? Yeah, like she had yeah. to remain as Gale to save her because she was so ill. No. <laughs> See, Shane, you have all these high minded ideas of what the message is, and I'm just thinking it's pretty obvious. It's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, that, that is There's a bit that, of that too. That is probably yeah. what it might come down to, so. What I found funny is that at the end, you go back to the council and you tell Saren this is what actually happened. And, you know, after all the fuss and bother about trying to get everyone to team up at the start, the minute you say we've got to go after Carapac, everyone's on the same team. <laughs> <laughs> they probably all knew it from the very beginning, too. Yeah. Well, it's just like as soon as you say, right, we've got to go after someone and kill them. They're like, right, let's go. Let's go on yeah. a road trip. Let's do this together. Woo. Like, <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, but yeah there's, there's a bit of post-quest dialogue there as well to go through alright so head back to the uh, Birthorp castle if you didn't do that I'm going to do that I don't know why I didn't do that this time um, mm-hmm. so that's pretty much uh, quest complete on this front and you know what what you ultimately uh, do get from this quest in terms of rewards is a huge lamp you also get something called Charles's clue carrier 
which allows you to store reward caskets and a whole boatload of clues so that they're not going to be clogging up your bank space or your inventory or anything um, to that effect. And I know there's going to be lots of people who are very, very pleased with that. So I think that's a good reward. Mm -hmm. Um, A master clue scroll as well and three quest points, which signifies that um, this is one of the more uh, impressive quests when it comes to uh, direction and lore on this front. So two things left to do before we wrap this one up. Um, where do we head next in this adventure? We follow Carapac, I think. Okay. I suspect this is okay. I'm going to, my money is on wherever Carapac's gone. That is the big summer update they keep talking about. Yeah. Okay. And they said That's it towards I the, I think they said towards the northeast or east, I think was the general yeah, direction. Yeah, northeast. They, they actually named it as well, but I can't remember what it, um, it's called. Begins with an O. Let me have a quick look at that. Um, ah, I can't find that. But that is probably where the summer update is. And I'd also like to say at this point in the live stream, they did say that there are going to be updates to this uh, storyline that are not going to be in the quest. They're going to be brought in through different means as well. So it's not going to be entirely quest-based. Yes, there's going to be story content that's not quests. That's going to be good. Is... That's going to be something interesting to try for RS, I think. Yeah, I remember when they were talking about the Hunter Modernization update, um, they said they're going to try and bring in lore and story to more areas of the game, which I'm very, very happy about. Hmm. Um, trying to make it all a bit more unified. Fascinating. All right. Um, I guess we just have to rate the quest now out of five. Oh, I I don't want to give it a solid five out of five because I feel like it... I'd say four and a half. Okay. There were a couple of things that... There's, there's one bit in particular that bothers me a little bit. Which part? In the second animated cutscene when Carapac is taking control of the needle, right. someone is narrate, narr- bleh, bleh, bleh. Someone is doing a narration over the top. There's a woman talking. And it, I, I, don't, I can't work out who it is. I thought like, it was it's Saren. Saying, is that Saren? I, it sounded like the same voice as Saren from the beginning. I couldn't work out like, who in that scene was doing it. And also it was being narrated in the past tense as well, which really kind of broke my immersion hmm. because it went from me being in the moment to me being told what happened. So I didn't really like that. Okay. Um, and I would like to get it clarified, like who's who's actually meant to be talking there? Who's the storyteller? Yeah, that would have been good. Okay. Um, but other than that, it was a really good quest and very, very exciting um, start to a new quest line. I'm going to so, yeah. go with a five. Uh, You're t- going to go with a five? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tannis, do you have a uh, rating? I'm abstaining at okay. this point. That's fair. Yes. Alrighty, well, that is the newest quest, Desperate Times, three quest points, um, a big, big reveal at the end of it, uh, you know, definitely something that uh, I don't think many people saw coming, though it's better to find it out at the end of the quest than in the beginning, such as we did in the V quest, so with that being said, I'm going to move us on to the patch notes right now, and there's only a few of them this week, uh, a couple small ones, and um, I pointed this out last week first and foremost. Um, for the oldest clans in the game, they now show a creation date of April 12, 2011, rather than January 1st, 1970, <laughs> which, of course, is t- in relation to the Unix timestamp thing, Time Zero. Oh, is that what caused it? Yeah, Time Zero inside uh... computer systems is set to be um, December 31st, 1969 at 1159, 1159. So second one right after that is January 1st, 1970. At right. Um, I did find that because Clan Quest had that problem as well. And suddenly we were 20, like 30 years older than the game itself, <laughs> yeah. which was, you know, we were happy to roll with it, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, clan <laughs> members should one. also no longer a trigger has been in the clan for zero years broadcast. Well, Good. When you view a clan's info via the guest clan chat, it will no longer always mention January as their creation month. So something that obviously wasn't uh, plugged in. Job titles will now update the clan chat player list when alphabetical position changes with the display name. That's good. And um, 
players who were partway through the cabin fever quest at the point where they'd already added six plunder to their plunder chest will now once again be able to continue and complete the quest. We made a change some time ago to only use five plunder down from the original six, and anyone who had already stored six plunder and stopped the quest will have found themselves unable to continue despite the chest being full. And uh, Glout got tired of standing up all weekend during the Saren event and can no longer hold up the illusion that he is Glauf. He's surprised that the World Guardian did not notice he was impersonating him and tried to arrest him. That was a funny little error. Yeah, because it was, was just, just a typo there. as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there were a lot of other uh, people in there that were probably stone faced as well. So just <laughs> they, had, they had a good impersonation of that of the live stream. Mm. Okay. Um, Ready for the other big one this week? The Comp Cape design blog? Mm. Mm. More Comp Cape. More mm. Comp Cape shenanigans. <laughs> mm. Oh, I'm waiting for this one, Shane. So mm. uh, I, had to, I had to do a double take on this because I was left unsatisfied reading this. But then I realized that one of our very first early suggestions and something I would have been okay with was effectively this suggestion for the comp cave rework. <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't I say. You, I remember you guys talking about saying the, the, the big design was just too complicated. Yeah. Yep. So they, this was our, our first conversation and you know what it taught me? Stick to your guns and don't let Shane convince you of shit. <laughs> Because I was right. <laughs> and then you, you guys convinced me, like, oh, no, it's, it's okay. No, it wasn't I mean, okay. you guys had some really good discussions said. about it. Of course we did. <laughs> yeah. Like, some of the more reasonable discussions that I've seen. But... <laughs> oh, it's definitely the Brexit of RuneScape at the moment. Like, backwards and forwards, no, and no one can get anything that's decided. One of, that's one uh, way If you want to know what in. Brexit is like in the UK at the moment, it's basically the comp cape rework. Oh, I know. Like, <laughs> just, it's it's nuts. But they keep, I mean, what's that, how's that saying go? Like, keep it simple, stupid? I mean, that's what they went to. Yeah. That's what, that's what yeah. we're trying to tell that's, them. That's what design should be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because this solves the problem, as much as people might not yeah. like hearing it. And it solves it in a simple way. Um, okay, I'm going to sum up the way this this ultimately shook down because I can – this rework can literally be described in four bullet points in two sentences. First and foremost, comp and trim are remaining as they are. Number two, Reaper and Castle Wars are being removed from the comp and trim cape respectively. Number <laughs> three, stats will be taken off and added as a passive bonus to the Reaper crew achievement. Utility benefits will be put on the player. There's your four, four bullet points, and the two following sentences are that there will be clearer definitions for future comp and trim comp achievements, and there, it is, there is a potential that existing content could have achievements added, but they won't be added in one huge batch, as polling proved that would be wildly unpopular. That is the comp cape rework as of this week. Mm-hmm. It, it's... It's um, it's pretty much exactly what we talked about, right? The first week, and yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna cover the other side of it where I where I say that I'm unsatisfied with this, um, because and when I say unsatisfied, I'm unsatisfied from a design perspective because what we saw from the complicated design was a great design. It really was, and I think everybody agreed to that, and everybody bought into it. And remember back when we were looking at the uh, pictures of the concept artwork? Mm -hmm. I said, Mm -hmm. this is going to sell the comp cape rework. It is going to make people who want this update attached to it. And it did. And that's why people are upset about this change that was made here. Yeah, I wish that (laughs) I wish we could have been here first and not went down that road because um at the end of the day you're right you convinced me for a reason it was a good design but it's a design in search of a problem yeah and that, you know Mon Osborne actually said that yeah on the stream um and you know i'm gonna say that the thing that is lost by not going with the complicated design or the more in-depth design is that 
it removes a good chunk of choice and progression from the completionist endgame of RuneScape because with the other more complicated design you had a choice of whether you do the skill achievements first and yes you still do but it's a it's a cognizant choice that you're making or you could do lore achievements first you make that choice and you're rewarded with it through progression along the way by getting an intermediate skilling cape or an intermediate lore cape and then two other tiers of capes on top of that so that is why that was a good design, and that is, I think, the biggest problem with removing this. And, you know, there are people who are upset about this, and, you know, rightly so, I think, because it is a it was a complete redefinition of the endgame RuneScape experience. And, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I um I wrote wrote about this in my Informer article this week, informer.rsbnb.com, and you wanna know the the brutal truth about this. Sirion and I had a good, probably hour-long text ch- chat about this rework design. And we said, yeah, it's great. It, it fixes the problem. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, you ready for this? The business case. Because it's a lot easier to retain someone who has spent hundreds of hours in game hunting comp than it will be to find a new player who is going to do the same thing with an untested and unproven design. So if a bunch of people left and they didn't keep engaging with the game, Jax would ultimately have to build that demographic up again. And plus there's also the thing that they have this big hunter project coming where they are going to be severely nerfing the top XP rates of that skill that they're probably just choosing to use their goodwill up that they have on the Hunter update at this point, rather than oh, a risk of concrete rework that has the chance of losing people. So, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're right about that, but I also think, you know, it's it says something that they've got the guts to go up against skilling. Yeah. Not so much when it comes to comp or PVM or anything like that, but oh, we have courage when it comes to skill. You know why? Because we don't have a strong skilling co- council. If if we had a skilling we council, that was we, a, we apparently do, but they've well, never we been apparently introduced. No, they're not as strong as the combat council. Like they don't have the same kind of influence, or at least they don't fight the same. I'm not willing to. I'm not willing to go out there and believe that just yet until we meet who they are. We should know who they are, Shane. <laughs> like I know, part I'm, saying, of it. I'm saying we should know who they are. That's why I'm not convinced that it's it's the same thing. You might have people that are, you know, like vaguely. I, I don't know. I I don't think it's as it's defined as what the combat council is, um, and I think you can see that because they're not able to. De- defend in the same way. I mean, it's just. <sighs> and yes, it's a business, but you have to look. It's like, it's also from, it's also more like from a player standpoint. Every, I, I swear they they mentioned everything that that I had been talking about with people being attached to their stuff. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, that's why like this doesn't bother me because. I mean, in a way, it's more, it's more for the, I mean, it's for the players. Like it's, it's more, it might not be the absolute best design perspective, but it's good for people that's been playing. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, you don't play because you're a designer, you play yeah. because you're a player. And you know, this is a good design still. It's yeah, just, no, I'm, it's I mean, just, it's, 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 been, it's, just, it's, just, it's just been overshadowed because we saw what could be. And, you know, yeah. I even go out of the way at the end of the article to suggest that, and, you know, I don't normally read these things out to you guys. I don't like telegraphing what I wrote. I want you guys to go, of course, read them. But I said that we could have, for example, a um, an update that brings in virtual meta achievement capes. When you complete all the achievements in one category, you could be awarded with a cape potentially. Right. But – I think that was one of its weaknesses. Like as cool as the capes looked, 
um, I think it would have devalued the idea of having a cape, and that's something that goes back forever in this game. That's kind of like oh, your so you, thing. So by, so by adding in more, you lose the prestige. Well, you lose the identity. You lose the being able to look at it and know what it is, like offhand. Like, yeah, Os- Osborne mentioned that in the stream. He's saying that one of the biggest weaknesses of the, the 15 cape design is that you're adding in 15 new capes, and if you just look at them, it's not immediately obvious. You almost have to look up, oh, what's that cape look like? Which is a very fair point yeah. to have, especially if you're not familiar with the update. And he so, hit the nail on the head. Achievements needs to be simple. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I did like, like, I'm the kind of player, I'm very much a casual player. I'll say that off the bat. I'm not the kind of person who ever thought I would comp just because I looked at all the requirements. Like, I just don't have the time and the, the resources to engage with that level of content. So I was quite looking forward to the update in terms of adding in stepping stones because it was like, oh, I could get my foot in the door. I could sure. like, break it up into smaller chunks and make it more manageable. But I understand why they're not going ahead with that. Like, and I think I am the kind of person that believes completionism should be, you know, maybe not complete, like do absolutely everything, but it should be close to that level. So I don't know. I'm, I'm quite glad they went for the simpler design in the end, I think. But as someone who's probably never going to comp, <laughs> like, I don't really think I have a say in it. And to me, I mean, um, at the end of the day, the, the sky is still blue, water is still wet. Life carries on. Yeah. I'm not. It's just a that, cape. <laughs> I'm not in that push. And in some ways, you know, you got to wonder how the original design with that many even got off the bat. If Moth Sports had those things about the entire grid of 50 capes being confusing. Yeah. Well, and you know what? Like for me, this is actually. I mean, this is actually a wonderful design. This is much more freedom, and it means that I have a much better chance of being able to get the comp cape. Like, this brings it within reach. This is the way that I like things. I like things where it's like, if you can work and earn it. Mm. Um, There's no way I can do Reaper, no matter how good I get. I can't do it. So Yeah, that was kind of the main thing that put me off comp as well. Like. I know a lot of other people have said it as well, but group PVM is just way, way out of my reach. And I think will always be out of my reach. So it kind of cuts me out of the whole, now it's not on comp. There's a chance that, oh, maybe, you know, I could actually try for it. Um, And, you know, the, the biggest thing that people are missing out of this is one line in here um, that says that, uh, you can combine your passive stats with any cape, which means that capes matter again and frees us up to add better capes as rewards and drops in the future. Oh, so and good. yeah, and they're going to be adding. I mean, if you think like this makes it easier for people, I don't think so. Oh, no, no, At, no, no. In no, the no. least, they are going to be adding so much. Every yeah, update. Like, for example, the first ones on that it. are going to be added, they're going to be the, adding the salty, sanding, and yeah. EI, EIO. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's their what their replacement for Castle Wars. And like I didn't like okay, I'll, I'll admit straight off, I didn't know the whole Castle Wars thing was a an achievement. Like was it five hundred hours? Joke. And like I could not believe when I read that 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 was a genuine achievement. Like how did someone think that was okay to yeah. put in? And Ma Jack put it the way it needed to be said. There's a good there's a there's a question of how much standing around in a dead mini game is a good idea. Yeah, like, I, like replacing all... it, replacing it in with the, you know, actually completing the arc and player own farms and Menafoss and engaging with content that's been released. Like, yeah, of course they should like replace it with something like that. <laughs> like, yeah. to, to me, that makes sense. Um, right now, the goal is to make as few changes as they can going forward. Um, also. With that, Mod Jack has an idea in the back of his head about how Reaper should be handled in the future, but that's not a conversation for today. That's a conversation for the future in regards to that one specific achievement with that. And in particular, um, as we said when we started off, Mod Jack said that this update with the milestones was an update that Jagex brought on themselves and no one asked for it. And, you know, you got to wonder at that point. Why did it get brought to the players? Because I know um, out there, uh, Parnassius in particular is very upset about losing the milestones. But if you know we had not been brought into this 
this process, if they had just gone with the simpler design and started with that, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So no, we would be, but and that's see how ironic is that though? We would be singing the praises of uh-huh. dude, this is a great call uh-huh. pre work. Hell uh-huh. yeah, it's exactly. I didn't even know I wanted it, but this hell yeah, you yeah. know. But yet they 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 jagexed it, man. They told us <laughs> more than asked for our input, and then gave us a super awesome, super convoluted design, and then said, "Oh wait, no, we're just kidding. Um, we're gonna do yeah. the." But, it, it, but like in their defense, it wasn't just we're just kidding. It's the overwhelming response has been this is too complicated. Yes. So we're yeah. just the players that. think we're just kidding. That's what the players think. Yeah. Yeah. Wrongly. But like I, I think it is important to bear in mind that this simplification is in response to what they've been told. Like that's oh, the no, reason yeah, that's... they put out to players. They wanted to make sure well, they were on the right track and they weren't. That's like, the, the good the part base. of it. Like that's the good. That's the good news. And you well, know, when when we started off this whole thing, Mod Jack and his Four Direction team were involved in it, and I said this is going to be a successful update. And you know, barring the milestone issue, I think we are going to wind up with something successful because you know there is no clear definition of what should be on comp and what should be on trim. And you see, know, that surprises me to hear. I always assu- I always assumed there would be. Yeah. And that's why now there will be a clear understanding. And that perhaps is the biggest point with this. Mm. So I don't know. I'm okay with this, this, this update. I really don't have much else to say to it. Um, I think this is what we wanted the both of us here from the beginning. Uh, Diana, I know you said you don't plan on doing comp. Uh, Do you think this would make you do comp going forward? If it takes out the high level PVM, I have more of a chance of it. Okay. Fair enough. Like, like I know it's people say that PVM is part of completionism. Right. Da, 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 da. I'd like to see the but, high level P- PVM taken out of the master quest cape first. <laughs> well, to me, there's a whole That's different true. culture and game style with high level group PVM mm-hmm. that I just do not want to engage with. In terms yeah. of this is a game I play for fun. I don't want to have to deal <laughs> with those kind of people. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, like exactly. Right <laughs> Like and especially because I go in there with a P mod crown, like I'm gonna get uh-uh. the shit ripped out of me. Yeah. I just don't want to be engaged with those sorts of people. So now that that becomes a separate achievement that is rewarded in its own way with Reaper Crew, and obviously it should be rewarded because that's a huge amount of skill and time and dedication that goes into getting Reaper. But it's not included. It doesn't. It doesn't like force the rest of us to put our achievements predicated on someone else's behavior. Yeah. Like our achievement yeah. should be our own. It shouldn't be to do with how everyone else treats us and how wait, can we get in with this crowd in the first place. Yeah. Like that, that's my two cents on it. But then again, I'm probably never going to comp anyway. So uh, <laughs> right. um, one more thing on this, actually two more things before we go and move on to the next dev blog. Um, Castle Wars, oh, yeah, if it was one, designed today, oh, wouldn't have been on this on the comp cape if it was designed today so take that for what it's worth and i also did a poll that i did on twitter that came out 50 50 and i went into the swamp of the runescape subreddit and posted a straw (laughs) poll there and that came out to 55 45 answering that uh will the new simplified comp cape design encourage you to go for comp if you don't already have it 55% 55% say yes, 45% say no. I did ask people and I did encourage people to not answer if you already have comp. So I don't mm. know how accurate this can be, but it's fairly split down the middle. Yeah, it's, so, uh, this is another thing that um, I think, was it Jack or or maybe Osborne said it on the stream? Like people feel so, so strongly yeah, it's about polarized. their comp It's the biggest polarizing update that we have currently. So like they're, it's they're, best to They've tried take to the find simple... compromises and they just haven't been able to find it. Best to take the simple path and um, save the goodwill for the Hunter update, I think. Mm. So. Which, you know what? Sticking my guns on that one now. Learn my lesson <laughs> with this. Learn my lesson with this. <laughs> All right. And... But, Oh, go ahead. They, they, they. I was just gonna say, you know, at the end of the day, though, they did listen to the community, and that that was cool, and this was, I think, a good example of when that is uh, called for, and mm-hmm. when they're when you're just you're you're like stirring up a beehive for not much in return. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, so thanks for that. 
Yeah. All right. And, no, I appreciate them listening. And, you know, we, we spend goodwill on the Hunter Project. We pro- we hopefully come out as a net uh, net zero on the Comp Cape rework. But you build goodwill with something called the Bank Improvements and Placeholders Update. Da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> this was just sprung on us today. Uh, like so we haven't five had much hours time ago. to stew on it yet before the show. I don't show. think I've actually read the read the dev blog yet, so I'll just go over that quickly. Okay. So first and foremost, we're getting bank placeholders. And they say the rework was first announced at RuneFest 2016. And they got a bit, of our, a bit ahead of ourselves in the month that followed and hit an assortment of technical hurdles that prevented it from ever being launched. And they acknowledge that this has likely gone uh, some – gone some way to dampening your excitement and anticipation and we're sorry but we're hopeful with the changes planned we will make up for that with this protracted wait now bank placeholders of course are the most requested feature of the bank update and this is going to be solved by having that whenever the last of an item stack is withdrawn the item itself stays in place at zero quantity Therefore, putting a stop to unwanted shuffling, and any deposits of the item late at a later date will replace the the placeholder, and this feature can be turned on or turned off. Oh, isn't it beautiful? There's a isn't nice little beautiful? gif. There's, there's a gif of it in the news plot of how it works, and like that's that's so good. And you I know like what the that. best part about this is? Is that this gif is actually from within the game client, and not. A mock-up like we got the last time. Is that, oh, Didn't Shawnee oh, cool. say that this is actually his bank? Or something like that? I don't know. Oh, this tweet, because it, it's kind of painful to look at. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like, I love it. That, it's, it's a mess. It's just going to be weeks of, of bank standing. Everyone's just going to be standing <laughs> in a bank. <laughs> um, just clicking and clicking. Uh-huh. There's also going to be a whole boatload of under-the-hood improvements that they'll talk about in a future dev blog. But they have also reworked the bank interface slightly so that there is a new uh, tab scroll arrow that uh, allows you to scroll the tabs. And you now get 15 bank tabs up from the current nine that you get. So it's not the infinite tabs that were promised in the first, uh, in the first rework. But 15, I think, is an acceptable number. Mm-hmm. They have also added new buttons to the top right of the um, bank area. So you have the new tab button, which is a plus, and that frees up a bank tab slot that we currently have in game. There's also the placeholder button that allows you to uh, toggle on or toggle off. Uh, note withdrawal mode um, has had a slight transparency tweak. Uh, the bank pin button, no change. Diego's holiday item retrieval, the POH um, costume room retrieval as well is there. Then on the next row, you have bank presets, which, you know, we're already used to. Um, the worn equipment statistics window used to be hidden behind the worn icon button. Now it can be opened by clicking on the skills icon tab. You know, that one's a bit confusing, the skills icon tab to open that up. To open up the uh, worn yeah. equipment. That one will probably be changed. Um, then the backpack summoning or backpack person summoning and coin uh, buttons all function as they currently do as well. And then you see default number to move. Um, what that does, this is similar to the old school bank quantity option where you could withdraw or deposit the listed quantities with a left click. And if you need a custom value, you can set that with the X option. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And then down in section three, you have the backpack, worn, and beast of burden preset buttons all in one area in addition to your coin pouch. So you don't need to have a separate pane open up for that as well. And then um, at the very bottom, number four, you're going to see a filter option. And this will have items that uh, show junk, which shows you items that might be worth cleaning up and can be stored with Diango. Show members items or showed items that are only flagged as free to play. That's an interesting choice, I think. Mm. And going to be an important one probably with mobile coming out. Yes. Then finally, dynamic searching. Pressing the search button in the current bank gives you a box prompt, and if you're trying to type faster or switching between items, there's a noticeable delay. This update will introduce a dynamic search box that instantly responds, offering a far smoother experience. 
That's nice. cool. I wonder if there's still going to be the meta searches where you're going to be able to say food and it will pull all the food items up. Hmm. We'll have to I'm wait cool for behind the scenes to see that, I guess. Mm. Well, that's tomorrow, isn't it? There's a there's a stream oh, on like, oh, tomorrow. Oh, oh, oh. Three PM tomorrow. Shawnee's doing his data stream, and Mod Hunter will be on there as well to talk about oh. this rework. Well, I think we have the first update, update. You guys are going to be talking about next week. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, huh? Okay. Man, get, out the, get out the pad, the notepad. And then they have <laughs> the a uh, then they have a comparison between these uh, two two as well. Um, big question, when's this all going live? And they say they want to do this right, so there's going to be a beta. And the beta will happen in either July, August, or September of this year. Good. July, August, or September. All right. Soon. Very soon and See? close. That's, that's cool. This that's must be a terrifying thing to have to beta and test, though, because... It's uh-huh. not like the mining and smithing rework uh-huh. where if it goes wrong, it's it's big, but it's not breaking. Uh-huh. Like, if your bank goes wrong, that's too big to even like try to comprehend. This must that's be why they're doing terrifying. a beta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it must be quite a scary thing to try and develop. But it looks good so far. And, you know, this is, I think, a lot more easier to obtain than the first bank rework. That was a complete reimagining of it. Yeah, no, this is, once again, keeping it simple, giving us exactly what we were looking for. And You know the thing that's going to sell this I place? I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's, Shane, how many years? That's, that's what we've been saying. Like, give people placeholders, they're done. You call it a day at that. Everything else is gravy. <laughs> Yeah, Make but you know, there, there, to... like, there's the inner, there's still the inner part of me that would love to see so much more with this, but obviously, you know, technical, right? Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm cool with functionality if it if it works and it just makes my gameplay better. That's really all I'm looking for, and this this will do it. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I think that's all we have to say on this. I mean, it's it, it's a couple of images and a overview, and I think it will get the job done. We'll have to wait to see behind the scenes uh, what what further changes are going to be made with this. But uh, beyond that, who knew that this was going to be something we'd uh, be dealing with this year? So that's a, definitely a nice surprise. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, we do have a listener question, but before we do that, I'll just take a moment to thank our wonderful Patreon supporters for this episode. Um, without you guys, this what we do here at Update and what we do at the end of the month with the monthly bit and inside RSPB Update would just not all be possible. So this week, I'd like to thank Brock H., Diana, thank you, Kyle, right. <laughs> Logan H., Sue Juice, The Devil, Tom V, and Zez. Thank you all of you for your wonderful support and contributions to us here at RSBNB Update. The support truly does mean the world to us. And if you want to find out more about Patreon, just head over to patreon.com slash RSBNB. You can gain access to the entire back catalog of monthly bits for as little as a dollar a month. Get early access to our show notes, a special mention in the show notes, and ability to join in our roundtable discussions when we do them. And perhaps most importantly, you get to vote on the topic for the monthly bit. And our poll on that for this month has concluded. And this month we are going to be talking about the rise of AFK Scape. And that will be available in the first week of June. So keep an eye out for that. For $3 a month, you can also uh, gain a special VIP rank on Discord and a mention on the podcast at the start of the month, as well as high-quality stereo AAC versions of the show. And for $5 a month, you get a shout-out on the podcast every week, including exclusive access to the outtakes that we use for the clip show at the end of the year. And what we're doing with this, of course, is the monthly bit. Also, inside RSVNB update, interviews with the hosts and producers. And at this point today, we are only $4 away from that $50 tier that enables the RSBNB update roundtable on the first Saturday of every month, which is a oh, conversation about so everything close. and everything RuneScape related. Oh, so close. I can't wait for that. Yeah, that's going to be a I love the roundtables. Yeah. yeah. Good and, times. And should you know there be a crazy person out there and we reach $99 a month, we will do movie night with Shane and Tannis 
every month in the RSBNB Discord, as we'll run through some of our favorite movies, and Star Trek will definitely be in there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I just have to say this, that here for the uh, May the 4th weekend, the, the Space Channel showed all the original Star Trek movies. That's nice. because they're losers. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Mean. You can't do st- no Star Trek goes on first contact weekend. May the fourth is Star Wars weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so all of this and more can be found at patreon.com slash RSBNB. So thank you to everybody who uh supports the podcast uh, monetarily on Patreon and who has just been oh so grateful to us over all the years. Patreon.com slash RSBNB. Okie doke. So we do have a listener question this week from Sunset Fish, and he asks, what is an element from a different MMORPG that you would not mind RuneScape implementing? He says, for me, I've always liked the idea of a marriage system like the Phoenix Dynasty online system, where if both you and your partner were online at the same time, you get an XP bonus, plus matching titles is cute. That is wow. quite cute, actually. Yeah, and you know, I mean, hey, legalized RuneScape marriage, people have been wanting that for years, right? <laughs> Damn e daters. <laughs> Buying GF, one GP. Oh. <laughs> as people used to say. Um, okay, <laughs> so for me, um, I'm going to go first on this one, and I'm going to talk about the reputation system on Star Trek Online. And, you know, about every year, about every eight months or so, they bring out something called the new reputation system. I think there's 13 or 14 of them in game right now and what you do is you com- complete various uh cues or uh, as they're called now task force objectives i think and you get um a currency that you can spend in that reputation system and first and foremost you level that reputation system up to tier five and eventually tier six and you unlock things along the way that improve your character and can be used on your ships and your um ground officers and your own officer itself and it's one of the most dynamic forms of progression in that game and that it offers the best equipment in the game for effectively zero cost and that is something that is sorely missing from runescape right now is that yeah we have masterwork and trim masterwork we have the ports armors and whatnot which are good but what if there was a different system in place where every you know, and this is going to be a huge project. Just say, you know, every six to eight months, or maybe even every eight to twelve months, Jagex remastered one of the existing mini games in RuneScape and allowed that mini game and maybe some associated skills to farm various RuneScape reputation marks to level up a reputation system in RuneScape that provided a new means of progression that could award some of the best equipment in game without needing to spend, you know, billions or millions of EC on, or GP on it and have it just be useful in whether you're skilling or whether you're doing combat or we already have the questing one, but you could maybe even have a questing focused reputation system as well. And I think that's something that uh, would be interesting to see from a progression standpoint and could be one of the biggest updates that has ever been brought to RuneScape. So that's what I'd like to see. Nice. Cool. Uh, Tannis, I know you play uh, other MMOs, so I'll you go first. Um, yeah, so I guess the one thing that I I would love is pretty common to just about any MMO, um, but I wish we had other playable races. Like, I think it'd be cool to have a character like that was an elf or a dwarf, something like that. Um, yeah, I wish we weren't always just boring humans. So, like um, characters. But, yeah, just just give it a little little flavor, a little spice. Um, but I think the main the main thing that I would I would bring in would probably be the um, the like the pay model of uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic. Um, it does that like everything. You have access to to like the basic game and everything um, free, but then. If you have subscribed at any time ever for like one month, then that puts you into another class called preferred class, um, which you still have access to like uh, all of the content as of the time that you had subscribed. Um, and it, it it's kind of a middle tier for 
Um, if you have subscribed in the past, you, you get more um, benefits than if you were just total free to play, even though you're not paying um, ongoing. Uh, and then, of course, they, you have the you know subscription where you get every you know expansion DLC, every everything new comes in, and you get a certain number of um, their currency and stuff, which for us would be like rune coins. Yeah, um, that would come with yeah. you know membership. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to see that. I, th- I think that would be, um, I think that would be cool. All right. Uh, how about you, da- Dan? I know you don't play many MMOs, but uh... yeah. So this is this is a difficult question for me to answer because I don't actually play a lot of MMOs. RuneScape, I think, is the only really multiplayer game I play. So I don't really have an answer for this one. Um, I'm planning on getting involved in more, kind of after my life settles down and I actually have time to. <laughs> But for now, yeah, I don't really have an answer. All right, that's that fine. Well, if you guys want to send questions in, what you can do is you can email them to questions at rsbnb.com and they will reach the appropriate source to be uh, in the show. Or you can uh, send them to us on Twitter at rsbnb, either in the form of DM or at mention. I think that's what we're going to do for the next two weeks for the form of uh, – questions and we'll get them to the appropriate source for that um but yeah questions are great discussion topics are great so send those in all right tech news time um you know we talked about this one when it was first announced last year and uh you know the android app store allowed steam to implement it exactly as they wanted and what we are talking about is steam link which is the uh, piece of software that Steam produced for Android and iOS that allows people to stream a game to an iOS device. And, you know, the big part of this is that Apple didn't want having want Steam Link to have access to the Steam Store because, you know, that is obviously a direct competitor to Apple, and Apple was uh, wary of the 30% cut that they would be missing if they allowed Steam to effectively sell games for free in terms of something that was on their app. So for anybody who has an iOS device or even an Apple TV, you can now get Steam Link. And what this will let you do is effectively let you project any game that you can run on Steam and run it over to your computer or big screen TV. And this is something that Android has had for a while. Um, I'm actually really excited about this because I am, of course, an iOS user and Apple uh, TV user as well. So I didn't get to experience Steam Link last year. And Tennis, I know you're also an iOS user. I don't know how a game that requires a mouse and cursor would work on this, though. But uh, controllers you can play on your TV, like on Apple TV? No, no, I mean if you were using your phone. Oh, a phone. Oh, okay, okay, I got you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, never mind. Here's a picture. On the left-hand side is a pad that allows you to uh, control um, the various buttons, and on the right side you got the standard A, B, X, Y buttons as well. Hmm. hmm. And, well, that's cool. You know, there's also the Steam Link console that you can buy that is a effectively an hdmi plug that connects over wi-fi and you can run that to your computer and you know we've had that as a pick of the week before when earth was on the show last year and it is absolutely amazing so we need to have a look and see exactly how this works and uh what happens with this and you know it's a shame at this point that uh there are games out there that uh you know we could run on our tv but they might not um but they might not work with Steam, and I'm thinking RuneScape because I always wanted to have RuneScape on yeah. the TV, but never been able to uh, figure out yeah. a way to do that. So, oh, well, that's cool. I, I wasn't. I mean, I we have an Apple TV, so I'm. This is making me think. Yeah. Cool. You can put ESO up. On cool it. ideas. I know yeah. ESO <laughs> isn't Steam, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Mine is. Okay. Yeah. And almost. You- Everything is in Steam unless it's Origin. Rocket you know? League. Yeah. For for now. Fun. Yeah, for now. For now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. I just uh, I just opened the Steam Link app on my phone. Um, I'm going to use touch controls. Scanning for computers running Steam. Oh, it found it right away. Oh boy. 
That's nice. that's amazing. Live I found review, it guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except I'm not going to be able to launch a game because it's on the other uh, screen. And where's that pin? So you so you're given a pin and you enter it in. And then it tests the connection over your Wi-Fi to see what's capable. And here I've got a connection upwards of 30 megabits per second, 40, 50. And this is over Wi-Fi too, so that's, that's actually pretty darn good. Nice. Um, but yeah, we'll let that run uh, and see what happens with that as the show progresses, and I'll report back. Um, but I'm going to play around with this after the fact, and this was something that uh, just caught my eye today when I was uh, doing final show prep. But uh, we do have another big tech news story with this, and that is that Microsoft and Sony are forming a gaming and or cloud gaming and AI partnership. And you know what? You know what probably forced them to do this, right? Uh, Google. Google Stadia. Yep. yep. Um, of course, because Microsoft has their huge cloud infrastructure with Azure. So that will, of course, um, you know, if Sony wanted to do a cloud gaming service, they could host it on Microsoft. And Microsoft... Well, they're, go ahead. They're, I was just going to say, like, I have I think I've even done a pick of Sony's um, online yeah. uh, gaming platform. and It's good. So they're probably using that and putting it together with Microsoft's cloud. No. Yeah, Microsoft uh, says that they want to use these efforts to uh, build better development platforms for the content creator community. And, you know, we, we've seen that Microsoft has gone so far forward to opening up the Xbox to third party developers that maybe my, that Sony could possibly be doing something along this line as well. I wonder. Mm hmm. Um, Google, of course, is the one that they're targeting with this, with their Stadia gaming service that they announced, which is going to be so ubiquitous that all you'll need is Chrome in order to work with it as it uses, um, the YouTube technology to push the games to people and, uh, just provide a little bit of interactivity amongst that. And of course, they're also partnering in on artificial intelligence which will include the Azure AI image sensors that Microsoft has. And Sony is going to be using its Microsoft's AI platform in consumer products. That's pretty big. Hmm. I don't know what it means, but... Yeah, I, sure. don't, I don't know what it means. We'll have to see what the products look like at the end of the day. And, you know, that's something that Microsoft has always had a, had a, had a problem with is, you know, they create these great examples of technology... But they never implement something that the user can use that the end is good for the end user. If not, it's you know something that's targeted for enterprise or maybe a uh, technological preview, kind of like the first big table surface was, right? Um, mm -hmm. Then we saw Microsoft advance forward with the Windows Phone and the Surface laptops, and um, eventually run their own line of hardware as well. So Microsoft has been getting better at it, but they've always sought out third parties in order to actually make it a reality. So that's something that uh, I think only good can come from this because, you know, we're not seeing exactly that, hey, PlayStation and Xbox are going to be all combined into one. That's not what this is. And they're still going to be very uh, distinct and unique. So um, they both have infrastructure that the other can benefit from. Hmm. Maybe we'll finally get some uh, cross-platform play because they'll have to play nice now <sighs> since they have, you know, they have no choice. Yeah. I don't want to get. I don't want to get our hopes up on that. <laughs> well, no, I hear you. Yeah. All right. So, you know, Google I/O was also last week, and there's just so much big stuff to come out of it. Um, we talked a bit about it, but there's also. Um, some stuff that we can focus on in regards to accessibility, which I thought would be uh, good to do as well, because you know when you when you look at what Google has announced this past year, many of the uh, of the projects going forward that they have are are ones that you know on their own are just okay. That that's neat. But if you look at 
what they are actually announced this year. They're pretty big, and um, I'm just going to run through a list of some of them, and I know, Tannis, you're going to find interest in some of these. So the first one is Google Lens Text-to-Speech, which is entirely um, executed on device. You'll be able to effectively take a picture of something, and your phone will read it out to you. <laughs> Good stuff. Which, which, of, which, of course, is, is important for you um, with, 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 your, with your visual impairment. Yeah. So, and do you think this could force you out of the iOS ecosystem? Um, honestly, it's almost to a point now where it's a, it's, it's a legitimate choice, whereas before I don't, it wasn't really. Um, but now I think it is a choice. It's just a matter of what are you used to using? I'm used to iOS now. Um, but I like the fact that I actually could have the freedom to change if I wanted to. Or, and if that is like a, um, like that comes with, I mean, if that's just like built in, then maybe. Because and to be fair, I you might also be able to just get the Google Assistant app on iOS and do it eventually. Yeah, I mean that that'd be cool because I have I have a few third party apps that are supposed to do that, but none of them do it really well. So um, I'm curious to see what what they do. I mean, even my glasses don't do that as well as what they're supposed to be able to yeah and it can even do translations as well oh that's really cool um next one we talked about last week a bit was live transcribe and the idea behind this is that um the app will ultimately transcribe everything that it hears so anyone hard of hearing can follow a conversation so this means that even if you were on a video call it would provide closed captioning for you Oh, that's really cool, but it's totally going to get someone in trouble somehow. Oh? I mean, I just can think that if something's writing down everything that's said in a room, it's going to come back to bite somebody oh, well, eventually. Well, this somehow. is just like the other one. It's going to be all done on device. Okay. Not sent to the cloud. Oh. Yeah. See, that's something that could be handy for me, like especially if it's like a big, I'm just thinking of big busy meetings. It could be so hard to keep track of what's going on. Like, yeah. So somebody, yeah, no, that's quite handy. So somebody like could that. effectively okay. write an app then, because this is all going to be hooked into the APIs, and so somebody could effectively write a, you know, like a standard memo recording app. But in addition to the audio file, you also get a text file. Oh, that would have been. Oh my god! You know what? That would have been so good for me. And um, see, that's supposed to be for for hearing impaired. This would have helped me because. I could have just put my phone out during a lecture. I always had to have a note taker with me because I couldn't see the board right. or anything. I could have just put my phone out and I would have had notes automatically. Boom, right there. Yeah. Next. And, you know, we, 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 we need to not get too excited about this one because anybody can look at the current state of, you know, transcription in any uh, YouTube video that has automatically generated closed captions. They're okay, but they're not, you know, the best. So. Right. They can be unintentionally funny. Yes. How, yes. How not great they are. Yeah. We have had that's, some. That's true. We have had some clip shows before with that. <laughs> Shane does get the random text from time to time. Yep. Yeah, I got one of those this week. <laughs> yep. You need to teach your phone the difference between a nibble and a, and a nipple, Tannis. I I, I know. <laughs> It really gets those two mixed up. <laughs> I don't know why, but okay. Uh, next up is sound amplifier, and this is uh, for people with hearing disabilities. This allows you to adjust the sound settings of the phone to make it easier to hear. Um, this would be for Android uh, 9 Pi. And also uh, live caption and live replay. This is for videos or any video and phone call. And with that, um, this will automatically do the closed captioning on this. So actually what we were talking about uh, in regards to live transcribe, that was what we were talking about with uh, the note taking. So that already exists, but live caption is the one for videos and phone calls. Oh, okay. So this that's is going to cool. exist. Yeah, that's – man, I'm telling you, it, I, I just hope that I'm not really 
old to be able to enjoy all this stuff because at some point I'm going to be able to be in a car and it's going to be driving me while I'm using my Android phone doing all this stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I just hope I'm not 80 Apple's when it all got, gets fired uh, out. Apple's got some stuff to do in a couple of weeks with WWDC and all this. WW what? WWDC, the Worldwide Developers Conference. Oh, it's at the okay. start of June. All right. Um, then there's also Project Euphonia, which is, uh, as they say, one of Google's biggest announcements from I.O. This is uh, meant for people uh, to help people who are suffering from ALS or people who had a stroke or otherwise have other speech impediments. And Google is using machine learning to understand hard speech and facial expressions and turn it into text so that people can have meaningful conversations. So. Damn. And all this is going to be free. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like, do you, but <laughs> do you know, like, the thousands and thousands of dollars any one of those things uh-huh. would have cost before? Yep. Like, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's cool. I, I'd imagine that's got to be really, pretty, really pretty cool. emotional for you. Y- yeah, I, yeah, um, because yeah, like you said, this one would the, um, the live transcribe would effectively eliminate your need to have a note taker with you. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, would have saved. Um, it, 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 it's just, it, it would, it's just a better way of doing things. That's, that's cool. It, it's very cool. I, I think we're finally at a point to where I, I don't think we're going to be able to get gouged the same way we've had to before and i don't know is it is it gouging when you only have a handful of people that need it um so you you know the market is what the market is but to be able to provide this for everybody for free i mean you just can't imagine it but yeah i I don't see us going back now i mean i I don't think we're gonna have to pay like we did before. How much did one of those pieces of software cost, just out of curiosity? Um, before there was... Okay, so before there was, um, like, the you know, the Windows magnifier, um, if you weren't an Apple user, now Apple's had it, you know, for a long time, but if you weren't an Apple user, um, you used software called ZoomText, and when I had that, it was about 1200 and I think that was back in... 06 or 07 jeez something like that but that didn't even like that didn't even come close to the Criswell software and the Criswell is what I needed um in college because like I'd have my books um scanned and then they would be transcribed into a daisy file which could was like could be read by um a different separate reader I had essentially it backed up images with text, right? It, it put actual text, right? Backed up the image. Um, and I would have to use that because if I had to go do research and borrow something from a library, I couldn't go cutting the binding off and throwing yeah. it through a sheet yeah. scanner. Right. <laughs> so, so I would have to actually, you know, physically scan page by page. And, um, that software was close to 3000. Um, I mean, the glass is sitting right next to me that our e site, Nine thousand. It's yeah. Woo. Well, I mean, this is a future or a, a perk of living in the future, twenty nineteen. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, um, that's pretty much it for tech news. We're going to move on to some other things, including coverage of our two skill of the month competitions this month. We have fire making and Slayer. Fire making has since concluded. Uh, congratulations to Jam Andy fifty two for winning this one. Fourteen million thirty five thousand six hundred sixty seven fire making XP gained. Second place Pernasius with seven point seven million, and third place Compsci with one point three million XP gained. Jam Andy fifty two, if you're listening, I will be looking for you in the next coming days to de- de- deliver your bond prize to you and of course we do have the slayer competition which is a little bit less interesting tanis you are currently in first place with 2.9 million xp jam andy 52 and in second with 782k and pronasius in third with 177,000. nobody else has done anything in 
that one. So it's interesting to watch these competitions go. I'm I'm quite glad with how the fire making one turned out. I will definitely be doing more of these um, going forward. So yeah, it feels too quiet. Yeah. Feels like feels like you know one of those Vietnam movies where we're walking into a clearing, <laughs> somebody's going to jump out of the bushes and get me. <laughs> are you going to be doing one in June? Yes, we will. Uh, skills Cause... are not decided yet. Oh, because I might join in on the June one then, because I'll have some time. Yeah. If, if you're yeah. looking for people to take part, I might, um, might throw my hat. We in. are. Uh, I mean, uh, I haven't decided what the skills will be yet. We'll probably just throw them up random. Um, I don't think we'll do a combat one in June. We did a combat one this month, so. Nice. All right. Um, we do have some achievements as well. So I will uh, start us off with these. So first and foremost, we got Yitzi with uh, 99 ranged on May 12th. Kebab Thief got 120 Slayer on May 11th. The Lion got 120 Summoning also on the 11th. And Truly a Weeb got 99 Herblore on May 11th as well. So we got Zookeeper 53 got 99 Agility on also on May 11th. Uh, Lord Dusty got 120 farming on May 10th. Captain Metaphor got 99 invention on also on May 10th. Nicely done. And then, yes, great. We also had Rev City with 99 fire making on May 10th. Uh, Kurt 1S with 99 thieving May 10th. And Sax Peelier. Yeah, I with think that's the way. 99 fire making on May 10th. So, nice job, everybody. Good good achievements. Nicely done. Nicely done. All right, time for pick of the week. And um, I believe we're going to pass this over to you, Diana. So, what do you got for us? Yeah, so my pick of the week this week is Good Omens, which is a TV series coming out at the end of the month. It's released on Amazon Prime on May 31st. And it's based on a book by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. It was released all the way back in 1990. It's a very, very old book. I think it was the first one Neil Gaiman ever wrote. Um, and it's yeah, it's basically my all-time favorite novel. Okay. It's really, really funny and lighthearted. Like I don't know whether you guys have ever read any Terry Pratchett books or no. Neil Gaiman books. They're they're very silly, but also really good, easy reads and. I don't want to say like they're deep or anything, but they're they're, they're quite thought provoking at different places. Um, and yeah, they're finally making it into a TV series with uh, Michael Sheen and David Tennant as the two leads, and then like a whole bunch of quite big name actors um, just all jumping in on it. I think it's going to be six episodes, and they're all releasing at once, so they're just going to dump it on Amazon Prime and let everyone binge. And I'm I'm really really excited for it. Like like I said, it's it's one of my favorite books, and Neil Gaiman's been the showrunner for it for the TV show. So it's he's adapting his own book for TV. No, well, that's got to be good then. Yeah, yeah. Like he he did the writing for it. Which, yeah. Like for me, the main problem with TV adaptations it's always someone else's yeah, interpretation. Yeah, and, of the and book. you lose a bit along the way too. Yeah, yeah. But with this, it's the same guy who's making yeah, it. So, so hopefully, you shouldn't uh, lose too much. Yeah, it, it should be really good, and I'm, I'm really excited for it neat and you know that's something you, you get a lot more these days with uh you know modern streaming services you can have uh these one-off um you know what would have initially been obscure tv shows be actually successful and be able to be uh carried to market with fans so um mm, that's good mm, yeah all right so that is good omens and i'll try and find a link to a place where people can watch that though it might not uh be out yet because it uh, premieres on the 31st on amazon prime so and apparently uh, broadcast weekly on BBC Two if you're in the UK. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a BBC collaboration with okay. Amazon Prime. So if you're in the UK, it will be on BBC as well at some point. I don't know when. Um, but for everyone else, it'll be, on, it'll be on Prime. All righty. So what have we been up to this week? Let's start with you, Tannis. Um, a lot of Slayer. Well, not a lot, but I mean Slayer. <laughs> and <laughs> I've been doing, or I did the needle skips last night, which was probably my second favorite quest ever. Maybe. What was your first? I mean, <sighs> world wakes. I mean, it's, okay. it's probably gotta be world wakes. Um, but it was just so well done. I mean, it, it was just so good. And I, you know, I, I love it when they voice stuff. I, 
it was it was good it was just really good um so anyway did all that so that i could come in fresh today with just having done the quest and hit a bunch of puzzles and said i don't get it and that's where we're at <laughs> so yeah all right uh how about, how about you uh diana I've been still very slowly working on my Max Cape. I'm still doing that. It's taken me a oh, long that's time. Good. Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> I mean, I kind of have to at the moment. Like, I made time for the quest this week and I made time to play through and do all that kind of stuff. But I'm in the middle of university final season at the moment. So I'm not getting a lot of time to actually play RuneScape maybe an hour a day or so. Like, um, it's taken a bit of a backseat. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just slowly skilling away, chipping away at it. Um, getting close, but still a few months to go off, I think. All right. Well, we will definitely be watching for those 99s to come in. and uh... Yeah, like I'm, <laughs> I am planning on getting a lot of 99s at once. And there's another uh, person in, in Clan Quest who's planning on doing the okay. same thing. And we're tentatively going to do it at the same time. So there may be a day with nice. both of us getting nice. 20 nice. 99s each. Okay, we'll be, we'll be ready for that one. one. <laughs> yeah. That should be fun, but I apologize to everyone oh, for the no, spam. Oh, no, that's fine. That's <laughs> fine. All right. Um, as for me this week, obviously the quest. I uh, recharged some divine energy. That had been a while uh, since I'd done that. And i just been, um, you know, doing a bit of uh, bamboo woodcutting, did some crystallized Acadia. I think I like the bamboo easier because it's more lean back, to be honest. And it's a decent XP rate. It it's a nice to- environment to do it in as well. I yeah. love the arc. It turned out my yeah. island that I had saved when I was um, uh, when I was uh, farming or not farming when I I forget what I what I saved this one for I have no idea why I saved it but it had t- two golden bamboo on it nice so uh, that was good um, but aside from that uh, not too much RuneScape related as I have been getting ready to depart I am leaving you guys for for two weeks so I am leaving the podcast for two weeks I am going on a vacation. And I am leaving the podcast in the capable hands of Utanis as being head producer while I am gone. And Sirion will be handling the technical side of things and uh, helping you out with the producing job. And you two will be co-hosting while I'm gone. That's awesome. Shane, I, did, I want to hear you say it, though. You, am, you, know, you, know what, you know what it is, right? What am I going to say? Number one. You have the bridge. Come oh, on, Shane. Oh, oh, yeah. Come on, Shane. <laughs> no, no, I don't see it as that. Oh. But okay, you can, you can have the bridge while I'm gone. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> well, and, you know, that's what I was alluding to earlier with the questions. I will, of course, forward any questions that come in via email or the Twitter account to uh, the appropriate people. So please do keep sending those questions in and um, might even create a forum topic for that. But uh, it sounds like you guys are going to have an interesting week next week talking about the bank rework yet again. It'll be fun to get uh, you and Siri on both on there discussing that from different perspectives. So And we get a data stream tomorrow. So, hey. Yeah. We're already off to a good start. Things like slowest boss kill times and stuff tomorrow, Ooh. so it should be quite fun. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, with that being said, you can find full show notes at update.rsbnb.com. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast listener out there. You can head on over to update.rsbnb.com slash subscribe to figure that out. Um, we're also on Twitter at rsbnb. And if you want to join us in game, you can find us at friends chat. Bits, bytes, and of course, show notes and more at update.rsbnb.com. And these guys will be back next week, but I'll be back in three weeks. I'm taking two weeks off. So with that being said, have fun, everyone. Take care. See ya. Bye-bye.